Good afternoon and welcome. There's plenty of food, but I'd encourage folks to take a seat. I think we're being, I don't know what the technical term is, we're, we're being broadcast. Uh, so I think we, we want to start on time. Um, the food will remain uh, during the talk and afterwards, and you're welcome to uh, grab refreshments uh, after uh, Eric Rosengren's speech. And uh, you're also encouraged to ask him a few questions when he's done. But I wanted at the outset to welcome all of you. Ira Jackson is my name. I'm dean of the John W. McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies here at UMass Boston. And if this is your first time visiting Boston's only public research university, uh, we're very glad to see you today at UMass Boston. If you're a student or here because your professor told you to attend and to write a paper, we're also glad to see you. Over the past several months, we've been hosting a series of civic leaders who are making difference, who are making a difference in our public life. We call it the McCormick Leadership Series. Most recently, we hosted virtually all the candidates for mayor of Boston, the general manager of the MBTA, the head of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, the founder of Opportunity Nation, Earlier today, the Chief Executive Officer of Share Our Strength, a major national nonprofit, and next month, the co-founder of City Year. In addition to a public address and Q&A with faculty and students, each of these leaders have been interviewed on the public affairs program of WUMB Radio, Commonwealth Journal, which I host. Uh, tune in for my 30-minute conversation with President Rosengren on Sunday evening at 7 on December First, if you're interested, you can either tune in to WUMB or WEEI-FM, which is also the broadcast vo voice of uh, the World Series champion Boston Red Sox. They, they will be covering my interview as well. In December uh, 1913, nearly 100 years ago, the Federal Reserve Act became law, and within a year, the 12 Federal Reserve Banks were open. The Boston Fed, along with the other 11 Federal Reserve Banks nationwide and the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. make up our nation's central bank. They are tasked with controlling interest rates, monetary policy, and overseeing the banking system. In short, the Fed sets monetary policy for the nation. The Boston Fed serves the, federal, the first Federal Reserve District that includes the six New England states, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Today, it's our pride to host the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Eric Rosengren has been leading the first district of the Federal Reserve System since 2007 and serves on the Fed's powerful FM, FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, which sets interest rates. President Rosengren has held senior positions within the Federal Reserve System in both the research and supervisory branches. He joined the Fed as a young economist in the research department, and he has been the author of more than 100 articles and papers on economics and finance, including macroeconomics, international banking, bank supervision, and risk management. At the Fed, Eric Rosengren has, was promoted to senior vice president and head of supervision and regulation. While in the bank supervisory function, he obtained significant domestic and international regulatory experience related to the Basel II capital Accord. The son of Swedish immigrants, Eric graduated with highest honors from Colby College. He earned his PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. The Fed has a responsibility for both employment and inflation, and it is, of course, the lender of last resort. Arguably, without the interventionist policy of the Fed over the past five years, the Great Recession would have been deeper and even longer. The president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston wears many hats, including a, keeping a close watch on not only the global and national economy, but the particular needs and opportunities of our regional economy here in New England. Please join me in a warm UMass Boston welcome to the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, Eric Rosengren. Thank you very much. Can everybody in the back row hear me? I tend to wander away from the podium, so make sure I can actually be heard. Um, thank you, Ira, for that very kind introduction. 
I'm going to give a little uh, perspective on what's been going on in the economy. Certainly it's been a great weekend for anybody who lives in Boston between the World Series, the celebration of the victory of the World Series, and what's been happening with the Patriots and all the scores that they've had. Uh, so it's been really wonderful over the weekend. I'm afraid I'm not going to be quite as uplifting as that. So I'll try to be more optimistic than I've been over a number of years. But nonetheless, I would highlight that uh, the economy still has a long way to go. So we're not quite at the celebratory stage yet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about monetary policy. And it used to be fairly easy to talk about monetary policy because we were just talking about one rate, the Fed funds rate, which is a short-term rate. And even though we were only talking about one rate, it was still kind of complicated to discuss in a general audience. But the short-term rates are now at zero, so monetary policies had to operate in a way that's uncharacteristic of central banks. And that's true not only in the United States, it's true in Europe, it's true in Japan. So a lot of countries have had to adopt a very different monetary policy than the kind of monetary policy I learned when I was in an economics class or in graduate school. So there are two tools that we've been primarily doing. Since the short-term rate is now at zero, there's not much we can do with a short-term rate. You can't really have a negative interest rate. So what we're trying to do is flatten the yield curve. We're trying to bring long rates down. So there are two ways we're trying to do that. One is we're buying long-term assets. And the assets that we're buying are long-term treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. So that's the first bullet up there. We're buying $85 billion per month. That's intended to bring and flatten the yield curve. The second thing we're doing is we're providing what's called forward guidance. That's also something we traditionally don't do. Normally, we would go into a meeting, just talk about what the economic conditions are now, and we'd vote on what policy was appropriate for this particular point in time. But we've been talking a little bit more in a forward way, in particular highlighting that we're going to keep short-term interest rates low until we see unemployment rate getting at least a 6.5%. So that's a threshold, not a target rate or a trigger rate so that we might wait till after 6.5%, but it's basically a promise that we won't start moving short-term rates up until we get the unemployment rate down to at least 6.5%. We're currently at 7.2% unemployment, so we still have a way to go before we hit that 6.5%. So these are the two tools that monetary policy is using right now. The economy has had some positive progress since the beginning of the year. The unemployment rates dropped from 7.9% to 72 so that is actually, by the unemployment standard, a reasonably good uh, improvement. I would highlight, though, that some of that's not through job creation. Some of that is the result of people pulling out of the workforce. So not all that is the way we want to get the unemployment rate down. But nonetheless, it has come down. I'm going to show you a couple charts in a couple minutes that highlight that interest-sensitive sectors have been responding to the very low uh, long-term rates. Housing's doing a lot better than it was doing before. Anybody in this audience who's looked for a car loan knows you can get a car loan for roughly 2%. That's a much lower rate than you'd get if we didn't have accommodative monetary policy. And the inflation rate is stabilized, but it's stabilized at a very low rate, below 2%. The PCE measure, which is the main measure that the Federal Reserve uses, is at 1.2%. So we're a long way away from where we eventually want inflation to be. So while we've had some progress, we need to make quite a bit more. So in terms of inflation, we have a target at 2%. Why wouldn't we have a lower target? But one of the concerns, if we have a negative shock, is we'd be facing deflation, where prices are going down. It's a problem that the Japanese have had over the last 15 or 20 years. What we've learned from that experience is, once you start having a deflation, it's very hard to get the economy to operate in the way that it normally does. So you want to have a little cushion. You don't want your inflation rate to get too low. So that's one reason we have a target that's higher than zero. It's at 2%. The second is what the definition of full employment. My own definition of full employment would be about 5.25% unemployment rate for the economy. Some of my peers at the FOMC have a higher rate than that. So the range tends to be 5.2 to 6%. So I'm at the lower end of where people's estimates of full employment. As I mentioned before, we're at 72 So we're pretty far away from full employment. So we have a long way to go to get where we're trying to get to. One of the reasons why it's been such a long time getting back to full employment is, one, we've had a very, very severe contraction as a result of the financial crisis. And we're still having some of the lingering problems from that. 
We also had very restrictive fiscal policy, and I'm going to give you some charts that highlight that. And our trading partners have not performed like they normally do. The Japanese economy has been pretty slow. The European economy has been particularly slow. Those are normally not the kind of context that we have a recovery in. So all those things, when I talk about headwinds, it's really talking about these three factors that have resulted in a slower recovery than we would have hoped. Now, I would highlight that monetary policy needs to be data dependent. The Federal Reserve loves data. I'm an economist. Economists love data. Many of you are taking economics classes. I'm sure you see lots of data in those classes. Um, so when we're thinking about monetary policy, we're not only thinking about where the economies come and where the economy is. Both of those things are very important. But we also want to think about where we want the economy to go. So we want to get to full employment. We want to get back to a 2% inflation rate. But we want to do it in a reasonable period of time. So how much stimulus do we need in order to get there in a reasonable amount of time? That's a lot of what the current discussion on monetary policy is about. So in terms of our purchase program, uh, there's been a lot of attention to our so-called purchase program and whether or not we would taper. And I would highlight that over the last two meetings, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that we've done. But uh, in my own view, we need to do a lot better than we've been doing before we should be tapering. In particular, um, I think it, we need to be sure that we have sustainable growth in the economy before we start pulling back on our purchase program. Now, I would note that as we uh, pull back on some of our purchases, that is still adding stimulus. We just won't be adding stimulus at the same rate that we have been with the current amount of purchases that we're doing. So let me start by talking about a yield curve. A yield curve is just looking at interest rates over differing maturities. So you can see on the horizontal axis, it goes from 0 to 30 years. And you can see the percent is just the interest rate on the yield curve. And if you look at May 1st, that's the green line. The reason I'm focusing on the green line is that was before uh, people were talking about changing our purchase program. So you can see that rates were a good bit lower than they currently are. In particular, if you look at the 10-year rate, which would just go up at 10, uh, in May it was about 1.66%. That's a lot lower than it is right now. So before we started talking about reducing the purchase program, the yield curve was reasonably flat. Starting in May, the chairman and other people started talking about maybe in the fall would be an appropriate time to start thinking about uh, cutting back on some of our purchases. And so the second line I'd call your attention to is the September 16th line, which was right before the last FO the two FOMCs ago. Um, and you can see that the rate had gotten quite high. So people were anticipating we were going to cut back on our purchase program, and the result had been our yield curve got much steeper. So again, if you look at the 10-year rate, it got pretty close to 3%. Well, going from 166 to 3%, that's actually a pretty big move in long-term rates. That actually is much more than I would have anticipated uh, would occur by a small change in our purchase program. It's also much more than the economy needed, given the current state of the economy. So one surprise is how much the long end of the yield curve moved up as people started talking about pulling back on our, back on our purchases. The second surprise was at the short end. The short end went up quite steeply. So I talked about there being two tools. One tool is the purchase program. The other is keeping rates low for a longer period of time. As long as those two tools are separate, you might not have expected the shorter term rates to go up nearly as much as they did. So I'd say there are two kind of surprising aspects of what happened between May and September. One was how steep it got and how much the long rates went up. And it's also even at the short end, rates went up pretty quickly. Now at the September meeting, we surprised a lot of people by announcing that we were not going to change our purchase program at all. And I'm going to give you a slide in the next slide that highlights how much those opinions changed. Uh, as a result, you can see the blue line, which is roughly where we are now. So rates have come back a little bit, which I think actually is favorable given the way the economy is growing. It's probably good that financial conditions are a little bit easier. So that gives you a sense of what's been happening over the last six months. In terms of what uh, some analysts were talking about for what they were expecting for Federal Reserve policy, uh, this chart is showing you 
the expectations of when we would start cutting back on our purchase program. So the chart on the left was right before the September FOMC meeting. The chart on the right was right after the FOMC meeting, and it was before all the fiscal issues occurred in October. So it was right after the FOMC meeting. And so on the left, you can see that a little bit over 50% of the primary dealers, which are uh, large brokerage firms that usually stand to buy and sell treasury securities, expected that we were going to be reducing the amount of purchases at the September meeting. You can see, though, there was still a reasonable probability after September, but they were really clustered around September. After the FOMC meeting, we clearly hadn't decided September, so it wasn't going to be in September, but you can see that it really pushed back pretty far, um, over 40% uh, probability that it was 2013 or later, so or at, starting next year. So that was a real big shift in people's expectations of when monetary policy would tighten. Now, an interesting aspect of the concern around are potentially cutting back on purchase programs, and the attention that the markets are placing on our purchase programs, is this gives you an idea of the Federal Reserve balance sheet and how large it's gotten. And you can see we're right up to $4 trillion. That really is big by historical standards. And I have two things here. One is the blue, which is no tapering through March, and one is the orange uh, dash line, which is we start tapering in December. So there's a lot of speculation whether we'll start cutting back in December or will we wait further and March is the next FOMC meeting in which there's a press conference, so many people are thinking those are the two dates that we might be thinking about. And what I want to highlight from this chart is whether we do it in December or whether we do it in March, it's pretty small relative to the size of the balance sheet. So in some sense, there's plenty of reasons to be patient because it's not going to make a big difference in the overall balance, whether we do it in December or March. So it makes sense to make sure we have the data that's consistent with the rationale that we want to get a more sustainable recovery. Now, I would highlight that both the dates and the purchase amounts are just examples. They're not actually what's being considered. And depending on how the data comes, it might be a very different date, or it might be a, a very different reduction in the purchase program. But what it does highlight is that Relative to the size of our balance sheet, whether it's December or March, it's not all that material. Now, just to get a sense of why we have such a large balance sheet and why it's been appropriate to have our unusual monetary policy, I think it's important to think about how this recession and recovery has differed from previous ones. So this looks at the blue line is the most recent recession and recovery. The orange line goes back to February 2001. The purple line is June 1990. And the green line is July 1981. And what it's looking at is how payroll employment changed from the peak through the recession and back to the recovery. So if you look at July 1981, you can see that we had a pretty steep recession, but we also had a pretty steep recovery. So within two years, we're back to where we were in terms of payroll employment. The two more recent recessions and recoveries were both the uh, very shallow recessions, but they were also very shallow recoveries. But even with the shallow recoveries, again, within roughly two years, we had the same amount of employment as we did at the previous peak. Now, if you look at the blue line, which is the current period, you can see one, in terms of employment, this is a much more severe experience than the last three, and it just highlights how different in terms of employment this has really been. It's also that we're now out uh, 42 months from the trough, and we still haven't gotten back to the peak of employment. That's very different than the previous three experiences. So one reason that we're taking very different monetary policy actions, the severity of the problem that we're still currently facing is really quite severe, if you look at the endpoint on the blue line and go and look at the bottom part for the purple line, you can see where we are now is roughly the worst in terms of employment during the June 1990 recession, which is why it's still appropriate to have very accommodative monetary policy. Now, there have been a number of reasons for why we haven't uh, increased as 
quickly as we would have hoped. Some of that is the headwinds that I was talking about. So certainly after a financial shock of the magnitude that we experienced in 2008, you would probably expect that there would be a slower recovery because balance sheets of households and businesses were dramatically affected. But I also want to argue that part of it is the fiscal austerity that we've had over the last couple of years have actually influenced how quickly the recovery has occurred. So this looks at government employment. The uh, shaded part is the recession. And what you can see is coming out of this recession, employment for government, now this is not just federal, this is state and local as well as federal, uh, employment has come down quite dramatically for government workers, roughly 750,000. That's a big decline in government employment, but particularly if you compare it relative to the previous recoveries. So going back to the green, November 1982, you can see that coming out of that very severe recession, one of the reasons that we recovered quickly is that government spending actually increased during that, and it's reflected in the fact that government employment went up pretty dramatically. You can see for the other two recoveries that was true as well. The blue line is very different than the other three. It highlights that the amount of austerity that we've had and the cutbacks in government jobs that we've had are actually very different than the experience we normally have in the first three or four years of a recovery. Now, there is some good news. Monetary policy has been very accommodative, and one of those areas that you would expect to see it would be in the housing sector. And in fact, we are seeing housing starts, which is uh, increases in new houses that are being produced, uh, have been going up, and that's a very positive sign. And it's even more positive if you look at auto and light truck sales. Auto and light truck sales are basically back to where they were prior to uh, the recession and the financial problems that we were facing. So interest-sensitive sectors have definitely been helped by monetary policy. In my own view, it would not be appropriate to say monetary policy is not having an effect. It ha is having an effect on things we can have an effect on. That's the interest-sensitive sectors. But something like fiscal policy we have no control over, the fact that we keep interest rates or higher low is not going to necessarily affect to a, a, a first approximation the amount of government spending that occurs or how much kind of cutbacks that we have in government spending. Now, if you look at it in terms of GDP, the goods and services produced in the economy instead of in terms of employment. What this is looking at is, again, the previous three recession recovery periods, and it's looking at how much did GDP change from the business cycle peak. Again, you see the pattern that the last two recessions were not nearly as severe, but in terms of GDP, it doesn't come out nearly as strongly as it does for employment. So you can see the blue line, again, is deeper but it isn't quite as striking as it is in the employment chart. But you can see that the improvement in GDP actually has been much more shallow, and you actually see it better if you tie it to uh, the trough of the recession. So you're just looking at the recovery period. So what's not been so striking was the first uh, two years of the recovery. Actually, the first two years of the recovery looked pretty similar to the previous two recessions that we had. What's been more surprising is that we haven't gotten the improvement in the last two years. So you can see that that blue line's been on a flatter trajectory, primarily in the last two years. So we haven't gotten the kind of recovery in the last two years that we would normally have expected at this stage of the recovery. Now, one of the things that we have to think about when we're talking about monetary policy is not only how fast is the economy growing and how much has it grown to date, but how long does it take to get where we're trying to get to? So this is a slightly complicated uh, chart, but I figured it was an academic audience, and so uh, you'd be able to figure out where I was trying to take this. So let me go through it relatively slowly. Um, so on the left, what I'm looking at is how, what kind of growth would you need to have in GDP to get to five and a quarter percent unemployment by the end of that year? So if you see the blue line, We'd need to see 5.2% growth if we wanted to get the unemployment rate to 5.25%, which I'm assuming is full employment, by the end of 2014. If you go to 2.8, the light blue, the far right triangle on the left panel, you can see if we only grow at 2.8%, it 
you're talking about waiting until 2018. So the growth rate in the economy does relate to how long it takes you to get to full employment. Now, making this calculation, I'm using a thing called Oaken's Law. Many of you have probably heard about Oaken's Law in your classes. But it's basically looking at what is the relationship between growth and the economy, in particular if you grow faster than potential, how quickly does the unemployment rate come down? So it's an estimated equation, it's an approximation, this really isn't a law at all, it's kind of a rough back of the envelope calculation. But assuming that that relationship, which holds reasonably well if you look at historical data, you can see that the growth rate that you would need, you'd certainly want to be seeing growth much faster than what we've been seeing, because the far uh, green rectangle is 2.2%. That's the growth rate that we've been experiencing in this recovery. So you can see if we grow at 2.8%, we're gonna be waiting until 2018 by Oaken's Law. That's a really long wait. The faster we grow, the more quickly we're gonna get back to full employment. You can see that the last two uh, recoveries, we grew roughly a little bit above 3%. That implies something closer to 2016 being the time that we get back to that five and a quarter percent uh, full employment number. So again, this is an approximation, but it does give you a magnitude of how much growth do we need in the economy if we want to get the economy back to full employment in a reasonable period of time. The second chart does the exact same thing on the left panel, but on the right panel it's taking the forecasts done by the FOMC participants. So every other meeting, we do a forecasting exercise. We forecast a bunch of variables, GDP, we forecast uh, employment numbers, we forecast inflation. And so it's looking at the midpoint of our forecasts and saying, what do we think that we're gonna have on average over through 2014, through 2015, and through 2016? What we're expecting is growth at 3% or a little bit better. Well, that puts you in the 2016 to 2017 time frame if we get that kind of growth. But I've highlighted that the kind of growth we're actually seeing right now is much closer to 2%, not 3%. Well, that difference, while 2 to 3% doesn't seem like a lot, when you start calculating how many years it takes you to get back to full employment, those differences really do matter. And so part of the discussion for monetary policy is how much are we willing to use monetary policy to push us to get to full employment during a reasonable period of time. So concluding observations. Uh, we've had a very highly accommodative monetary policy. That's partly to offset some of the headwinds we've been seeing. Those headwinds are coming from fiscal policy. They're coming from the financial crisis. They're coming from poor performance of many of our trading partners. But that is one of the reasons that we've had this very, very accommodative policy it would make sense to remove that accommodation as some of these headwinds subside. So the interest sensitive sectors have actually been growing fairly strongly. Residential investment over the last year has grown by a little over 15%. But what we need is some of these headwinds to subside like uh, the fiscal restrictions, like uh, what's been happening with our trading partners. And fortunately, most private for forecasts actually expect that there is gonna be improvement in these areas. So most forecasts are incorporating improvement in Europe, improvement in Japan, and that the fiscal headwinds won't be nearly as great next year as they are this year. As that actually happens, then it does make sense to start thinking about um, how much accommodation we want to remove. But I would highlight that more than likely we're going to remain quite accommodative regardless. In terms of my policy conclusions, one, we need to stay data-driven. We need to be focused on our mandate, which is how we're doing on inflation and unemployment. And we need to be sure that we achieve those goals in an appropriate period of time. So it's not that we get to those goals, it's how long do you want to wait till you get back to full employment? How long do you want to wait before you get back to 2% inflation? Um, once we, it is appropriate for us to start uh, reducing our purchase program, Nonetheless, it's likely to be quite a while before we start moving up on short-term interest rates. So the pace at which the Fed uh, raises rates is likely to be quite slow unless we start seeing growth much faster than what's currently expected. So I talk pretty fast. It was a pretty quick overview of economics, but I'd be glad to take a few of your questions.
please. I think they have a mic. Why don't you just wait for the mic to come? If you could identify yourself, that would be great. Yeah, Rachel Brown with LaRouche Policy Institute. I would just like to ask, when is the bottom going to fall out? Because you look at the transatlantic system, RBS is bankrupt, Deutsche Bank is bankrupt. Seems to me more like the trend is for total collapse, unless we actually put Glass-Steagall through. So I don't expect a total collapse. My forecast actually would be doing a lot better than a, a total collapse. But I would highlight there are plenty of things that remain uh, not fixed from the financial crisis. And so we do have the Dodd-Frank legislation. There's some positive aspects to that. But some of our financial institutions are not in as good a shape as we'd like still, though there has been some dramatic improvements. I'd highlight one area that I focused on is the money market mutual fund industry. Money market funds don't hold any capital. Um, and that is an area where there was a real problem during the financial crisis, that we did have runs on the money market fund industry. That's an area that the SEC is currently thinking about, but they really haven't made any decision to date. So there are a number of aspects of financial stability that haven't been addressed. So I agree that there still are plenty of concerns. Nonetheless, I think the monetary policy and activities going around the world are probably consistent with a slow recovery, but a recovery nonetheless. Excuse me? So it's taking all aspects of the Dodd-Frank. So some of it is there are much higher capital at financial institutions than there were prior to the crisis. There are a lot more restrictions on Dodd-Frank in terms of uh, thinking about what happens if a large institution gets into trouble. So uh, the powers that we have now are very different than the powers we had going into the financial crisis. So there have been a lot of changes, and you do see it in the balance sheets of many of our banks. What we're doing for bank supervision is quite different than what we were doing going into the crisis. Uh, the stress tests have actually, uh, I think, been a significant change in how we do bank supervision. The stress tests are one of the reasons why banks are holding significantly more capital than they were holding before. Many of our banks are much better capitalized than banks elsewhere in the world. That's not to say we've solved all the problems, but I think we're in a much better position than we were in 2007. Please. Oh, just wait, someone's coming over with a mic. You didn't um, mention any sort of more structural or institutional changes, especially since the 1980s. So, for example, <coughs> the minimum wage is at least 20% lower now than it was in the early 80s. Uh, what Guy Standing calls the, pre the uh, precarious employment has increased tremendously, either people who are contract workers or people who have uh, no pension plan or a whole set of changes around employment that <coughs> even if the GDP did grow as much as it had in the past, these underlying structural changes suggest that um, employers are not uh, uh, pulling in workers at the same in the same ways, um, even if they're doing it in the same rate, leaving, um, if you're more of the Keynesian notion, this, this notion of not enough demand, even if, even if unemployment rates fall. And I was curious if one, for example, uh, it's out of your hands too, but an increase in the minimum wage um, might be what's in order as opposed to um, uh, uh, a whole set of things, but also how, are any of those changes in the nature of employment taken into account in um, any of your projections? So the structure of the labor markets do matter for the kind of recovery that you get. And we are spending a lot of time trying to understand the structure of labor markets. And you've highlighted some of the aspects of the labor markets that uh, either haven't changed or should change. Um, one of the areas that's been a little bit surprising is how much the unemployment rate has come down. So we've only grown at 2.2% in terms of GDP, but the unemployment rate's gone from 10 to 7.2%. That's not something we would expect. Part of that is the change in the participation rate. A lot of people have pulled out of the workforce, as I mentioned. So there are a lot of puzzles that we're still trying to understand about what the long-run ramifications of the financial crisis and how that has impacted labor markets. So I agree with you that there's some things that we still need to understand. I focused my comments on monetary policy, so we obviously don't get to influence things like minimum wage. 
that's something that fiscal policy and, and legislatures have to, to consider. So that's not really within our purview. Um, but I would say if you thought the main reason for why the recovery has been so s slow is structural change, you probably wouldn't have expected um, inflation to be so low. So I would actually say that the main reason for why we're seeing problems right now is demand hasn't been as strong as we would really like. It's not so much a structural story. We're not seeing impediments in certain segments of the market that are causing wages and prices to go up. And so I actually would say that it's more being demand-driven than supply-driven at this time. But nonetheless, I think there are plenty of question marks in the labor markets that we're trying to understand a bit better. And certainly some of that is tied to uh, people's decisions about being in the labor force. That's everything from people the age of many of the people in this audience in terms of the choice between going to school, how long they'll be in school. It's also people with white hair deciding when they're going to retire and whether uh, at what time it's appropriate to retire. Can they find the kind of job they want or do they take an early retirement that may or may not be voluntary? So there are plenty of issues with the labor markets, but I've really focused on monetary policy because that's what we control. Yeah, with the slide, it's a little hard to see, so. <laughs> okay. You'll be next. There's another mic right over here. You had mentioned the beginning of your presentation in regards to considering tapering that 6.5% unemployment rate was somewhere where you wanted to be. Do you have a similar number for the U6 unemployment rate, which as of last month was 13.6%? Uh, so for the uh, U6. Um, so I've used the most common form of unemployment, and I had you could uh, look at the different measures of unemployment. When we're thinking about un unemployment, we do think about broad labor markets. We don't just think about one measure of unemployment. And I would highlight that we also look at things like payroll employment growth, what's happening uh, to wages and compensation. So some of our um, communication are tied to getting improvements in the labor markets. We don't just look at one unemployment statistic and we don't really tie it to one unemployment statistic, but we need a way to communicate. So we tend to use the unemployment rate that is most commonly cited, um, and that's what I've used in this presentation. But I would highlight that we look at all labor market conditions. We don't just look at one data series, we look at a variety of data series. And I'd say the same thing with inflation. So while our target's tied to the PCE uh, total inflation rate, we look at core, we look at CPI, we look at different measures of inflation as well. So with communication, we don't normally talk about different measures of inflation, we don't normally talk about different measures of uh, unemployment, but we do look at all those variables. So certainly um, some of the concerns about the number of part-time workers for economic reasons and other things are certainly something that we would take a hard look at when we're trying to understand what's happening in labor markets. Yeah, hi, Miles Robinson. I'm also with LaRouche. Uh, the arguments against Glass-Steagall from the Fed, from assets of Wall Street, from groupings in the city of London have been twofold. One, that it's antiquated and can't deal with the modern complexities of the current system. And two, that it wouldn't have stopped the crisis in 2008, which is somewhat irrelevant, both of which I think are totally wrong. Um, as the United States and Europe really commit to this inflationary policy of continuing the bailout, uh, putting in the legislation for the bail-in, and uh, really going with the quantitative easing policy. And as the Beige Book itself, coming out of Philadelphia, Dallas, and San Francisco specifically, have admitted, quite honestly, that the quantitative easing policy is not affecting the real economy substantially. As you said yourself, the unemployment rate is going down largely because of statistical manipulations. What could the argument, your argument now be against Glass-Steagall? It seems like it's an absolute no-brainer. So you have a couple different issues there. Um, one, let me get at, we're having no impact. So I actually disagree with that. Um, the economy has only been growing at 2.2%. That's much slower than what we would like. But the interest-sensitive sectors have actually been doing a good bit better. As I've highlighted in my comments, the kind of fiscal restraint and the kind of restraint from uh, some of our trading partners is really uncharacteristic of the recovery. And so I wouldn't say that monetary policy is not being effective. 
I would say that it's not strong enough to offset the kind of headwinds the economy's been facing over the last couple of years. So the argument's a little bit different than quantitative easing not having an impact. So I just wanted to make clear, if it weren't, wasn't clear in my talk, that I actually think quantitative easing has had a significant impact on interest rates and that those lower interest rates have a, a significant impact on how quickly the economy's growing. So Glass-Steagall, for those of you who don't follow bank supervision, Glass-Steagall is the separation of commercial banking from investment banking. During the crisis, one of the things that happened was a number of the investment banks got merged with the commercial banks. And so one of the issues is whether there should be a separation of commercial banking from investment banking, and that would be returning to Glass-Steagall. So it would be keeping depository institutions separate from investment banks, separate from insurance companies. So I think there are some arguments for and against Glass-Steagall. I would highlight, though, that I don't think it's a panacea. Um, I think part of the problem was that a number of our institutions were poorly capitalized relative to the risk that they were taking. And so some of it was really more of a capital problem rather than a, a structural issue with Glass-Steagall. And I would say even if the broker-dealers, we basically didn't have, this is gonna get a little technical, but uh, the broker-dealers were separate prior to the crisis. So Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley were not depository institutions. They were not commercial banks. They did have problems during the financial crisis, but we should care about what happens to those organizations because they can end up seizing financial markets in a way that's still very important. So it's a different run than what you get with a commercial bank. A commercial bank run is when deposits flow out of the banking system. But for an investment bank, if you're not willing to roll over their financing, they immediately run into difficulties. So I think there are a lot of issues with broker-dealer financing. Dan Trullo, who is a governor that's been focused on bank supervision, has made a number of comments highlighting why wholesale financing needs to be treated differently. So I think that might be the direction that I would actually encourage policy to go, is to think about the wholesale financing model, which includes some of the things that you would be concerned with with broker-dealers and Glass-Steagall, and that that might do a better job of avoiding the kind of crisis that we saw in the last financial crisis. Before we let you go, Mr. President, I was wondering if you could uh, shift a little bit from a focus on monetary policy to your regional outlook on uh, the New England economy. Your beige book uh, has insights, and this region and our capital city, if we could open the windows and look out at your beautiful building in the downtown skyline, there's $6 billion worth of construction taking place in Boston. It, uh, it almost looks like Shanghai, it's so prosperous, and many leaders from around the world, CEOs, prime ministers come here to model this uh, new economy that we have in greater Boston. What's your outlook, uh, not on the nation and on long-term um, employment and GDP growth, but are, are we doing the right things as a region in terms of our competitiveness, and how, how do you see the future for New England? So that's a great way to end my talk. Um, clearly in the Boston area, as you say, you just look out any of these beautiful windows and see what's happening in downtown Boston. There's definitely construction going on. Uh, the seaport area right across from the Federal Reserve is a very vibrant area. It's a young area. It's an area of town that's doing very well. It's very entrepreneurial. Um, there are a lot of things going on in Cambridge and the Kenmore Square area that are very, very exciting. So if you look at Boston, we're doing really well. I think you can look at some other parts of New England, they're not faring nearly as well. The gateway cities, the work, what the Federal Reserve's been doing some work in some of the working cities, highlights that they're, not all of Massachusetts has done well as Eastern Massachusetts, but I would say that overall, uh, New England has done much better than the rest of the country, and certainly Eastern Massachusetts has done much better than many other parts of New England. And interestingly, Vermont, New Hampshire, are very close to full employment now. So we have some regions of New England that are now doing quite well. Rhode Island still lagging behind, so is Connecticut. Um, but overall, I would say New England is doing quite well relative to the nation. I would expect that continue to occur. But there's still a couple of risks. Some of that's tied to defense spending. Um, we are a region of the country, particularly if you go through Connecticut, there's a lot of large defense contractors. They're obviously gonna be impacted by some of the fiscal changes that are going on. Uh, we're very reliant on healthcare, and we have some of the best hospitals in the world but that changing model for paying for hospitals, 
I think is a potential challenge, but I think New Englanders are up to that challenge and I think we'll fare quite well. And uh, you're the fact that Storm Clements and your helmet saved you that question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah.